Welcome to Harvest Mission Community Church. You are listening to one of our sermons. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Mark chapter 4. We're going to start from verse 26 and read it all the way through verse 29. So just uh, three short verses here, or actually four, and we're going to look at this passage together as I share about the theme and the vision for this coming year and as we enter into this new season. Mark chapter 4, verse 26 through 29. Once again, you could check out our app and all the notes and everything's there. Just follow along in that way. I'm excited to introduce to you the theme for the 2019 and 2020 uh, year. And the theme that we're going to be sharing with all of our HMCC churches in our family of churches is simply invest. Everyone say invest. Invest. That will be our theme. And I'm going to try to expound on this a little bit and how we're going to do that. Some of the things that God has given to us specifically as a vision here in Hong Kong and what it is that God is calling us to do and how you can be a part of it. I pray that many of you will take that next step and be a part of what God is doing. There's so many different ways to be a part of God's greater vision. So my question is this, what does it mean to invest? As you think about that word, I think for many of us, we put it in the context of the financial dealings. It's about investing money. And that's how many people in this world think about the word invest. But I want to just encourage us that there are so many other meanings for invest when it comes to so many different contexts. It's not just about money. According to the Oxford Dictionary, the word invest can also be defined in two other ways. So I want you to listen to the Oxford Dictionary's definition. The first one is this, devote one's time, effort, or energy to a particular undertaking with the expectation of a worthwhile result. I thought that was very helpful, that when you invest in something or someone What you have to be able to understand is that you are devoting just all of yourself, the time, the energy that you have, the effort that it's going to take. You are devoting all of yourself towards the undertaking with the expectation that the result that you're investing in, that you're hoping for, is going to be worthwhile. So you will not invest if you don't think that what you're investing in is worthwhile. Does that make sense? That's why some of you do not invest in exercising because you just don't think it's going to work. Some of you don't invest in school because some of you are just like, this is too hard. But once again, if you think it's worthwhile, you will invest in it. A second part of the dictionary or a definition is the word invest is provide someone or something with a particular quality or attribute. So you're providing someone or something. So once again, it's a part of giving of yourself to something, whether it's a quality or some kind of attribute. And that's what it means to invest. Therefore, we have to keep in mind that when we invest in anything, we are doing something in the present with their future in mind. So I want to say that again. Listen to me carefully. So when you invest, whatever it is, whatever you're investing in, it is investing in the present, knowing that maybe the fruits or the results will come later on. It's something future-oriented that you do right now because you believe it's going to happen. So it requires faith. I want to just kind of pause here and I'm I'm wondering how many of you have been reading up on just world events and how many of you in this room have heard about the NEOM project? Anybody? Does anyone know the NEOM project? (laughs) Not too many. All right. If you're in the business field, you either should go home or you're not keeping up. You you need to know this. Um, One of the things I enjoy doing is I, I read a lot. And I just, from all different disciplines, whether it's philosophy, business world, the arts, I I read up a lot because I I just really hunger for knowledge. I want to know. And then also it helps me to become a better uh, evangelist, someone to share the gospel. 
You could put me in a room with anybody and I could just have a conversation with them because of the things that I've learned over the years. But I want you to understand this is a pretty significant project that actually has started in Saudi Arabia. And it, the NEOM project is simply this, that they are trying to build a futuristic mega city in Saudi Arabia and it's going to be something that's going to be completely, just totally phenomenal. It's supposed to be the standard of building any city from this point forward. It's, it's going to be developed on the northwest side of Saudi Arabia. And it has literally 26,000 square kilometers. So if you kind of look at that, it's on the northwest uh, part of Saudi Arabia. It's a huge chunk of land that they're going to actually build this whole mega city. Just to give you some proportions so you understand is that if you've ever been to New York, New York City, it is 33 times bigger than New York City. Now you guys know New York City is packed, but it's going to be 33 times bigger than New York City. It's supposed to be connecting three continents together or relatively connect them together, uh, Africa, Asia, as well as Europe. And what they have discovered is that if this city, as it's being built, they believe that 70%, 70% of the world's population can get to the city under eight hours. That's, that's a whole lot of people just within an under an eight hour flight. This mega city is so futuristic that it will be one of a kind. Like I mentioned earlier, it's going to set the standard for all the cities to follow. Everything in this city is fully automated. It will run on renewable energy, and it's going to be run by robots. So just all the menial jobs you don't even have to do. Uh, we're talking about it's going to be renewable energy. It's going to be run by robots fully automated, they're going to have self-driving cars in the city. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to show you this promo video of this Neon project. And they just kind of share the vision for this futuristic city. So I want you to just dream with me for a second as you watch this city that I'm hoping that if they build it and they build it well, that We'll have a missions project there. That would be great. <laughs> Let's watch it together. Uh, who wants to leave Hong Kong right now and live in a place like that? Maybe it was a piano in the background. Ding, ding. And you're just like mesmerized. Like, I want that. I want that. It, it's still being built or they're, they, they have to try to raise a lot of money. And let me ask you, do you know how much it's going to cost? It seems like, oh, they're building another city. They have a lot of oil in Saudi Arabia, so they could do it. Like, do you know how much it's going to cost for something that futuristic? And that's something in the future where you're going to have to invest now. They said that it is estimated that this futuristic city will cost a total of 500 billion, that's a B, b -b 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 billion, and not Hong Kong dollars, USD. 500 billion US dollars to build. Once again, when we make an investment to something that's in the future, like you got to want it. You gotta desire this. You gotta be able to picture it and say, this is the imagined reality that I wanna see in my life, in our church, and that is what's gonna cause you and cause me to be invested, to make the investment of our time, our treasure, our talents that God has given unto us. This is where it will take a lot of devotion to the things that matter to God, a lot of devotion to things that are eternal. I'm wondering what are some things that you're willing to invest in 
so that you can see a better future. Not only for yourself, but you try to go beyond yourself, but also for the future generations that will come after you. For those of you who are working, adults or with families, that next generation, your kids, what, what, what kind of future are you imagining? For those of you who are students, if you're a senior about to graduate, what, what are you imagining for the next generation of, of freshmen and sophomores who will come in? Today, I want to spend some time unpacking the 2019-2020 theme or vision of HMCC. And what I want to do first is, before I kind of talk about it, I want to first draw some biblical principles about investing in the future and why sowing and reaping is such an important theme in Scripture. So once again, we have to keep in mind that in this season of our church, we're not going to reap what is being sown right away. We're talking about you got to be able to look at a little bit longer term, that what you are investing in right now, you might not be able to see it even in this year or in two years, or three years. It might take five years. It might take seven years, or even ten years. But because you believe that what we're talking about is worthwhile, that while you are here, and while you are able, that you are willing to invest the time, your talents, and your treasure. And so I want us to remember the process of being able to reap the harvest for the future. So I'm going to just quickly list them, and then in this passage, I will highlight those things. I want to talk about the process of reaping the harvest, and there's three simple things. The first one is sowing. Everyone say, the sowing. Sowing. The second one is the the growing. And the last one is the showing. Okay, so we turn to somebody next to you and just tell them it is the sowing, growing, and showing. Go ahead and let them know. So these three principles, I want you to kind of keep in mind as we look into this passage, draw the biblical principles out, and then I'll share with you the vision for our church for this coming year and beyond. Let's start off with verse 26, Mark chapter 4, verse 26, that says this, And he referred to Jesus, and he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Let's just pause here and think about this whole sowing aspect. One thing you have to understand is all throughout Jesus' ministry, he taught about the kingdom of God. Now, you have to remember the kingdom of God was not a specific location. It was not about this earthly king that will come and rule over all the earth. That, that was the mindset of so many Jewish people, and that was the mindset of the disciples. Oh, here's this Jesus who's performing all these miracles, so he's going to come and he's going to destroy all the Roman or government. He's going to dismantle all this, and he's going to establish his reign and rule here on this earth. That's why they were very disappointed when Jesus died. That's why the Jewish people could not believe that someone who is the Messiah would die on the cross. What you have to understand is that the kingdom of God, that language of the kingdom of God is related to God's sovereign rule and reign that goes beyond things that are tangible or here on this earth. It's overarching that he rules and reigns over all the earth and over all the universe, the whole universe and all the different solar systems that we have in the universe. The concept of the kingdom of God is both being in the present and also the future. This is why it's important to understand. Because Jesus, when he came into this earth, he inaugurated, he started the kingdom of God, his reign here on this earth. So it's already here, but it is not yet. It's something in the future, fully in the future, when Jesus Christ will consummate that when he comes back in his second return. And so that's why you will usually see the phrase when we talk about the kingdom of God, it's already here, but not yet. It is here because Jesus inaugurated it when he came and he, after he got baptized, he went into 
and fasted for 40 days. He went into the temple. He opened up the scroll of Isaiah, and then he read it, and he goes, Today, in your hearing, this prophecy has been fulfilled. So he inaugurated, he started, the kingdom of God is what? Here. But to understand the full reign and the full rule of God, that is something that will come when he will completely do away with Satan and he will separate those who know him and those who do not, trusted in him as Savior, and then he will consummate that as we talk about the marriage of the Lamb. That's, that's all the imagery about it's here but not yet. And the powerful thing about the future is that there will come a time when his work of redeeming all people that he has called will be finished. And he will completely renew and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And that's when we know that the kingdom of God, though in the future now, but will be completely consummated. It is in this context that Jesus was teaching about the sowing, growing, and showing. The first thing that we see is the sowing. I want to talk a little bit about the sowing. I want you to look at verse um, verse 26 again. If you look at verse 26, you, what do you notice? You will notice the word scatter. The word scatter is translated as to throw or to cast. So think about this again. Let's go ahead and read verse 26 again. It says, the kingdom of God is as if a man would scatter or throw or cast the seed on the ground. Now, when you first read this, you realize that maybe the farmer or this man just randomly threw like seeds, that he has no purpose. That is not what Jesus is trying to say. When he says he scattered the seed or he threw the seed, what you have to understand is that what this is the heart of God. He is being generous. If, if you could try to imagine that he has like one of those sashes or these bags, and then he takes a handful of seed and he's throwing it on the ground. He's not just taking one and just planting it in a good place, but he's literally taking these seeds and he's scattering, he's throwing it on the ground. So what you see is the generosity of the sower as he's throwing the seed on the ground. Now that's something that I want you to Keep in mind this lavishing or this scattering generously of the seed. Now, this is the same concept that is found earlier in the parable of the sower. Just look a little bit of, for, uh, to all the way to verse 1 of chapter 4 in the book of Mark, as we have read uh, in um, verse 26. But if you go a little bit further, you will notice that the seed, the sower, it fell on the path, the rocky ground, amongst thorns, and the good soil. So this idea is continuing as he's talking about this growing seed is that the sower is generous in throwing the seed for future reaping. So I want you to just keep that in mind. So the challenge for us is to ask ourselves this. Are we generously scattering the seed of God's word into the lives of people and situations that God is bringing towards our way? If we want to see God work and experience a great reaping of the harvest, then we have to learn how to be generous with what we have, our time, our talents, and our treasures, the three T's. If we're talking about investing for the future, something that we desire and we think is worthwhile, if you are stingy or you, you are in control of you, what you want to do and what you don't want to do, I'm going to tell you this, that we're not going to see a great reaping. What we need to do is to understand the principle of when you sow, you do it generously. I think all of us, we want to do great things. But the important thing to remember is that God is always looking for obedience and faithfulness to what he has called us to do. I love what uh, jean Nicol Grew said in his book, The Hidden Life of the Soul. Listen to what he says. Nothing is small or great in God's sight. Whatever he wills come, becomes great to us. 
however seemingly trifling, and if once the voice of conscience tells us that he requires anything of us, we have no right to measure his importance. What it's simply saying is this. There's some of us that says, you know what, I don't really have much. Some of us will go, well, I'm not like that person. That person has this incredible job. Or this person has so talented. And so whatever it is that you do have, a lot of us, we kind of dismiss it and say, well, what, 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 what can really happen with this little thing that I have? And what this writer is trying to say is that it's not about how great or small something is, because you're not there to determine that. Some of the greatest things in life comes out of the small things that we offer. Look throughout scripture, you'll see it time and time again. God loves to choose the foolish and the unwise things of this world to shame the wise, to shame the strong. Again and again. And so the question is more about faithfulness and obedience to what God has given you. Yes, you might not have the salary, uh, salary like that person. You might not have the job. You might not have that kind of influence as that other person. You might not be as smart as that other person. But what is it that you have that God is challenging you to be generous and lavishing as you plant the seed? We have to trust God and make the investment in the things that he's calling us to do. Let me go ahead and read verse 27 and 28 as we talk about the sowing. As we just talked about that, I want to talk about the growing. Listen to what it says in verse 27. He sleeps and rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. Verse 28, the earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. Let's just pause here and look at this. Not only is there the sowing, as I mentioned, but we're reminded of the importance of the growing. Now, can I expound for you two basic principles that we have to understand about the growing? The first one is this. The results are produced by God. Come on, everyone say that. The results are produced by God. The person who sows the seed has nothing to do with the growing of the seed. Do you see that? He has nothing to do with it. In fact, it says the sower sleeps, rises at night or in the day, and then, you know, he goes to sleep at night. He does that over and over again. But the seed, even though he doesn't do anything, it sprouts And then it grows. Listen to the message translation of verse 27. It says this. Who then goes to bed and forgets about it? Referring to the sower. The seed sprouts and grows. Come on, read this with me. And he has no idea how it happens. I think that's that's one of the greatest things about God. It's like if we get it all figured out, we're like, who do you think is going to receive the credit? But when we are stuck and we don't know what to do and we pray and we turn to Him, we trust in Him, we don't know how it would happen. That's when you realize it's not about you. It's about God. It's about His glory. It's about His kingdom. It's about the people that He loves. But some of you, and I know we're a fairly young church. We have a lot of you who are still trying to find your identity. You're trying to find out who you are. You're not very secure. You're not very aware of yourself. And one of the things that I have to constantly remind us is that will you please think outside of yourself? We are so self-centered in our lives. And that's what leads to a lot of relational conflicts. That is the reason why it leads to a lot of other issues in your life. Because you make life all about yourself. And I'm telling you right now, life is not all about you. It's easy to make it about you because you feel the pain. There's a lot of stuff. You're stressed. And I'm telling you right now, the more you can quickly accept the fact that it's not about you, the quicker you can move forward and do the things that God is calling you to do. Turn to somebody next to you and just let them know it's not about you. Huh. It is literally a mystery. And it's up to God on how things are going to grow. You know, uh, one of the things that I, I, I 
constantly experience over and over again. And I think that's just God's way of kind of putting me in my place and reminding me of this truth. As I look back into all my years of doing ministry and being a pastor, I realized that there were some people that I spent a lot of time with, like every single week or like a couple times a week. And you, you see them making some progress. And it is so easy to forget that it's God who's working in their lives. So you kind of think to yourself, man, I'm really good. <laughs> like what takes a leader like three hours to try to figure out who they are? It just takes me 30 minutes just to ask the right questions. So what happens is uh, I leave that meeting and put on my headphones. And I'm like, you know, you kind of got to walk in your step. You're like, uh-huh. <laughs> who's next? And it's so easy to think, like, I don't even have to know you. You stranger, you're ordering some food at McDonald's, come to me. I will expose you and help you to see who you are. But you know what happens? As soon as you think you're making progress, all of a sudden they take a left turn. And you're like, what the? So then what you do is you try harder to try to help them and do all that stuff, but they keep on taking a left turn. And they take another left, so now they're going in the other direction. And you're like, what? And those are God's moments of saying, it's not you. It's not how wise you are, how smart, your psychology background, your sociology background, your reading of all this stuff. It's not about you. And then he likes to do it the other way. There are people in our church I don't even spend time with. I don't even know who you are. But all of a sudden, just God is working in their life. And you're like, who? What's, what's his name? What's her name? You have no clue. But God is working. And you just realize that it's, you had nothing to do with it. So you, you sit there listening to testimony. You, you want to hear these stories of, man, when I came, I was so lost. I was at the end of my ropes. And then I walked in on one of the Sundays and I heard your sermon, pastor. And it changed my life. You're waiting. You're waiting. No. And you come to the realization, it's, it's, you had nothing to do with it. It's not about you. And that's why I think it's important to understand as we think about investing. Not only do we generously and lavishly sow the seed and scatter it, because we just don't know how God's going to work, but then even the growth itself, we have to come to the realization, the results, what's going to happen, it is produced by God and God alone, not you. Not me. Not our church. It's God. And it's kind of interesting because this is such a good reminder that we should not be burdened. Listen to me. We should not be burdened with the results. Rather, that we just have to trust in God. Do you guys know what I'm trying to say? Some of us are like constantly like, oh my God, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, and we gotta see this happen. And the reason why is because you have a human paradigm that you think that if you do X, Y, Z, you should be able to get A, B, C. Because that's how you grow up. You put all this time into something and you should be able to get this, but it doesn't because why? Even the growing, it's not about you, it's God who will do the growing. This is cause us to trust in Him more. This should cause us to pray more, pray for people more, pray for situations more. This is where the gospel paradigm has to come in and remind us it's God and not us. Even in verse 28a, as we read, it says, the earth produces by itself. There is no need for help for the seed to grow because it's going to grow on your grow on its own. It's like we don't, we don't even have to be there. Once again, it reminds us of God's power and providence rather than what we are able to do. The apostle Paul had to remind the people of Corinth about this principle. Do you remember the story in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 6 through 7? I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. It says this, and read it in the yellow with me. It says this, I planted the seed in your heart and Apollos watered it, but It was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. 
Who cares who receives the credit? Because it's not about you. It's what God is doing. Who cares about like who did what? As long as at the end of the day, someone came to know Christ. And this is where I want to challenge some of you who are serving in ministry teams. Some of you are going to take a class today. I'm going to tell you right now, there will be times you will not be recognized. There will be times when you might even be discarded. You might not even be noticed. Like some of us who really like to be noticed, we like to do things that everyone can see. But do you know that there are are different ministry teams in our church that no one notices? I don't know how many of you know that we have a intercessory prayer team. That they come a little bit early. I don't know how early, but they come a little bit early. And they pray for our Sunday celebration. They pray for me, whoever's speaking. They pray for uh, you who are coming here. Like, who knows them? Like, no one will know. Do you know the seat that you're sitting on right now? Someone came early and lined them up. Might have been a little bit cricket, but I mean, they, they lined it up as best as they could so you could sit down. Do you know who did it? No. And so once again, God is doing things that in many ways, it's, it's him doing the growth. So the challenge for us is this. Are we trusting in God to produce the fruits rather than us trying so hard and getting frustrated with the lack of results? If you get frustrated with the lack of results, then you have a human paradigm. God, it's you that's going to help things to grow. It's You're the one who's going to help me to grow spiritually. You're the one who's going to help my disciples the person I'm discipling to grow. You're the one who's going to grow our life group. You're the one who's going to grow our church. You're the one who's going to grow just even greater love in our hearts. For God has to do that. So the first thing, as I mentioned, is not only that the results are produced by God, but another thing that we learn about the growing, because we talked about the sowing, now the growing is this. The results are progressive in time. In verse 28, we see that there is a gradual nature of growth. Now, some of you are like, ear, it comes out of your ear. What is that? A blade comes out of your ear. No, you know, as you guys know that as they talk about corn, they call that. Anyway, I'm going to just, let me just read it from the New Living Translation, okay? The simple English translation. Listen to what it says. The earth produces the crop on its own. First, a leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of wheat are formed, and finally the grain ripens. And so what he's saying is that there's a progression. It doesn't just go boom and then boom. That's why I don't know why so many of you are frustrated in your life when you don't grow. And I'm thinking, how how long have you been a Christian? Oh, just about a year. I'm like, a year? I'm like, Jesus. I'm I'm on the 27th or 37th year and I'm still struggling. I've been a Christian longer than some of you have been alive. (laughs) How scary is that? Some of you are like, that's scary. You're an old pastor. (laughs) Think about it. I think this is the reason why there are certain things that if you look at me and you're like, oh, wow, how does... Because... I've been trying to walk with God all these years. I, I haven't been perfect. There's been a lot of ups and downs, a lot of going sideways and coming back and circling and just getting lost. But by God's grace, I am here because of what he has done in my life. And some of you who think that once you become a Christian, all your sins, yes, it's forgiven and it's taken away, but your struggle with that, some of you are still struggling with the things of old. Because that stronghold, that bondage in your life has been so tightly wound into the fabric of who you are, your identity, and the things that you value. They're not of the kingdom. They're worldly values. Some of you are like, but I went to church all my life. But I'm telling you right now, when was it where your spirit was awakened that all the information you had about God, it came down to your heart and your heart was set on fire? That, I would say, is the moment that you really begin to understand. I'm not saying that's when you receive Christ, but that's when you begin to understand. That's the work of God. That's the Spirit of God. And when you get to that point, you realize more and more, wow, it just takes time. 
I think this is the same way, as I mentioned time and time again, about our walk with Christ. It's a process. It's going to require the time. That's why doing soap or to reading the Bible, praying with other people, going to life group, just doing the basic stuff, times of solitude, to be in His presence, to know God more, that takes habit. Some of you, some of us in this room, we are horrible with habits. But with bad habits, you're really good. But good habits, it's just hard. I, I'm the first one to confess it. I know I shouldn't eat past 10. And I'm not talking about PM. Or AM, I guess. But <laughs> Somebody like, huh? Like my mind knows this. But my stomach goes, eat. That one fry, French fry. I think they put something in there. They inject it with something. And you're just like, just one. But your hands are too big, so you grab more than one. (laughs) I think the way they make the fry, they measure the circumference, and then, so you have to grab at least two or three. We know things here, but it's so hard to live it out. It takes time. We live in such an instant culture. Therefore, we want everything to happen quickly. But we have to remember some things take time. Everyone say, it takes time. time. Especially those things that are important. It takes time. Relationships takes time. Development of a character takes time. Your relationship with God takes time. So the challenge for us is to ask ourselves, are we being patient and seeing our investments in people and kingdom things to grow, or do we feel like giving up? Let me close this passage with verse 29. It says this, But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. As we have talked about the sowing and the growing, And as we talked about, even in the growing, that it's God who produces the results and it's progressive in time. It takes time. Now I want to talk about the showing, the showing of the fruits, reaping the things so we can see that it's the work of God. In this verse, verse 29, we notice that when the grain is ripened, then the farmer will start harvesting the crop. It is all about the timing and the ripeness of the situation. How many of you, come on, you guys know, if if you don't know, then I don't know, you get other people. How many of you have bought bananas that are not ripe? If you have, those of you who like bananas that are not ripe, I'm just going to pray for you. That's all I'm going to (laughs) do. Because if I think about it, and I've tried it, is that you're eating like paste. And some of you like that. But bananas, it tastes best when it's what? It's ripe. Not when it's like completely like brown and stuff. That's when, you know, but when it's a little bit ripe. Uh, Watermelon. Chigua. You know, and uh, what else? There are so many. Avocados. I won't won't tell you who, but there are two ladies... uh, in my life who live in the same apartment they love avocados like I, I, I'm okay with it and so I, I know when somebody in our home bought avocados and it's not right because they will try to leave it out or there's different ways to do it to let it ripe but if you've ever had avocados that are not ripe what happens not very good you can't do that scoop You can't do that stuff. So when you think about it, there is this timing of when it's ripe, when it's good. Too early, it's not that good. Too late, it's not good either. And the reason why I'm sharing this is because here is this last verse that talks about there's going to come a time as you sow the seed generously and lavishly, and then as it begins to grow, what's going to happen now is what? 
that it's going to show for them the timing is perfect, and this is when you harvest it. I think for many of us, we find ourselves giving up too quickly because we don't see the fruits from our investments. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says this, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. At the proper time. Other translation says, in the season. As we continue to be faithful in what God has called us to do, then our hearts and even the things that we have invested in will become something that can produce fruit. Mark chapter 8, or excuse me, Mark chapter 4 verse 8 in the NIV. So remember the parable of the sower a little bit earlier? It says this, still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. Listen to the message translation. Some fell on good earth and came up with a flourishing, producing a harvest, exceeding his wildest dreams. Exceeding his wildest dreams. The challenge for us is simply, are we faithfully making the investments in our lives so that God can be the one who will produce and multiply the fruits? So let me give us the one thing. These are all biblical principles I want you need to understand before we talk about some of the things that we want to do this year. The one thing is simply this. When we trust, when we trust in God, so when we trust and start to invest, God's vision for us will manifest. When we trust in Him, and when we begin to make the investments, that's when the vision that God gives to us will begin to show forth. It will manifest in our lives. So with the theme of invest, I want to give us some next steps which will help us to move forward through this year. I'm going to try to go through this very quickly here. We want God's vision to manifest in our church, in our lives, in our church, as we learn how to trust and start to invest in the things that matter, the things that are worthwhile, that are in the future. So I'm going to challenge us to make investments throughout this year so that we are sowing and growing And then we'll be able to show the world the greatness of God. So I decided to make it very simple and use the acronym INVEST. Let me break it down really quickly. The first is this. Invest in your intimacy with God. If there's anything that I could encourage you with, it's simply this. You cannot do anything without first focusing on the most important thing, which is your relationship with God. I pray that in 2019, 2020, that will be your number one priority, that you are investing in your intimacy with God. You have to. Some of you are so busy going to life group, doing all their stuff, serving on a ministry team, and taking care of this, taking care of that, that your relationship with God is strained. And you could tell. Even though you're doing soap, because when some of you are reading other people's soap, it just doesn't seem deep. You could just tell they did it in five minutes. Sometimes when I read people's soap, because we send it out to each other for accountability and things, you can tell if this person really meditated and thought through this, chewed on that passage. But some of us, we're not as intimate with God that we want to be, and because we get killed by time, the busyness of life, carve out some time to say, this is what I'm going to do. Can I challenge some of you? I know some of you love to do soap at like three in the morning, two in the morning, and then you're like, pastor, I just go to sleep. And then in my dream, I do the application. I just imagine what that'll be like. I want to just challenge you with this. When was the last time you gave God your best? Not your leftovers. A lot of times, the first thing in the morning, when you get some rest, that's when you want to be able to give your best to God. But some of you then just quickly go and get busy, do classes or even at work, and about eight, nine hours of work, and you're exhausted. You go to another meeting, you're exhausted, and then you come home, and you're exhausted, and you're giving God leftovers. I don't, I, I personally think it's going to be really hard to grow in your intimacy with God. You're going to get very religious more than anything else. Oh, I've done my soul. I'm sending it out to these people. Who cares? Give God your best, your first hour, the first fruit of the day. This is my first hour, first 30 minutes of my day, first 20 minutes of my day. God, it's to you because you deserve my best. 
I don't want to make it legalistic. Some of you in the morning, it's not your best. It's like you want to kill somebody. Maybe your best is at 11. Some are like, but my best is at 2 in the morning, Pastor. But once again, unless you're afterwards you're wide awake and you can't go to sleep, give God your best time, your best moment in the day, because he deserves it. Grow in your intimacy with God. So the eye is what? Intimacy with God. That's what we need to invest on, invest in. The second thing is this. Invest in the next generation. It's important that we keep on reaching out to the previous stage of our lives. So if some of you are married and have kids, reach out to those who are married with no kids. If some of you are married and you don't have any kids, reach out to the single adults. They are lonely and they want to know how you did it because they're amazed because they don't think you could do it, but you did it. So they want to know what is your secret? And those of you who are single adults who are working, reach out to some of these re- people who are about to graduate because there's so many different things that they, they're going to struggle with. You struggle with it. Reach out to that next generation. Same with some of you who are in, uh, junior. Reach out to the sophomores or the freshmen. If we do not reach out to the next generation, we are one generation away from extinction. And if you don't believe me because I see it, if this older generation, the seniors, didn't reach out to these younger guys, there's going to be this gap. And once you graduate, there is, so we have to start pulling from people here who are still growing, but they're not at a level that can be mature to lead other people. I'm not trying to make you, feel, well, I am making you feel guilty. Come on, get, get with the program. So I'm challenging all you fourth year seniors. As you're thinking about jobs and, oh, I can't wait until I'm done. Look at the trail of your life. Who's following after you? Invest in the next generation. The third, so once again, the I is what? Intimacy with God. We need to invest in that. The second thing is the next generation. The V is invest in our vision for the circle. I'm not going to go into detail. Many of you already know this. Some of you are just learning this, and you will learn it more and more. Some of you are tired of maps. You're like, please, Pastor, I'm going to make another map for you because it's always the same map. But I don't know what else to say. A repetition is good, and these maps move me because God used that to speak to me. As you know, (laughs) the in-flight magazine, you guys remember, right? That God was saying to reach out to Hong Kong. And so God used this to speak to us to say reach out to Hong Kong. Why? Because as you reach out to Hong Kong, you'll be able to reach out to this part of the world. And then if you remember, we said 53% of the world's population lives within this circle. And guess what's in the middle? And don't say Taiwan. Guess what's in the middle? (laughs) (laughs) C-U-H-K. Okay. <laughs> this is the middle right here. <laughs> Hong Kong. And so this is the circle we want to reach out to. As we reach Hong Kong, we're going to be able to reach to other cities around the world. And that's why we said right here in Hong Kong, if we're four to five hours flight, we could reach this part of the world, the circle, by God's grace. And I'm praying that God will lead us to different opportunities for us to make the impact within the circle. That's what we talked about. Why is it important that we reach out to Hong Kong? Because we we believe that this is something God is calling us to do. And that's why I want to encourage you to not only invest in the vision for the circle, but we talked about the bold vision. How many guys remember the bold vision? Amen? Some of you are like, what? What is a bold vision? We said there are four things we want to see happen if we're going to even make the circle a reality. First, we want to build what? We want to build a school of ministry to train people. We're going to help equip people. We also talked about the O, which is open up one site locally and globally. And so this is something that we're really praying for, a church, that we're actually going to pray that God open up a church somewhere, either locally here, another site here, or somewhere globally. And one of the things we've been praying about is Shenzhen. That it's close enough that we can still be in relationship, but also be able to help reach China through our first city. And this is why we're praying for this. 
We also talked about launching at least one life group on different universities and, which is very important, all throughout the Hong Kong region. Some of you have seen that other picture before. We talked about this, where what would it be like if we were to go to all the MTRs, right? Do you guys remember that? And if we, we talked about how awesome would it be if we reach out to some of these different universities and then also some of these single adults who, I don't know how many of you know, but the single adults, they finally have a life group in the Kowloon area. The, amen. Now we got to go way out west and maybe out east somewhere because some people travel an hour, an hour and 15 minutes just to go to life group. But what would it be like if we can actually reach out? If we could go back to the other picture. If, if, if every single one of these are like the train stations, if we could just have some kind of life group there that people can just right after work or wherever they go, they can go to life group right at where it's closest to them. And then another thing that we talked about is not only building a school of ministry and opening up a, a church in locally and globally and launching life groups in campuses also in the region of Hong Kong, but we said we want to disciple 1,000 people through our live curriculum. And that's why we're going to try to go an ongoing relationship. We've been talking with one of the missionaries in China that some of these guys who actually came to know the Lord, we want to disciple them. I want to open up those kind of opportunities, especially those of you who have taken the Alive class to go with us to be able to, if you speak Chinese in particular, but there will be other places where you can speak English and be able to still teach other people. We want to make this a reality as we move forward. So invest in the vision for the circle, which entails the bold vision. So once again, the I is what? Intimacy with God. The N is what? The next generation. The V is what? Vision for the circle. The E is invest in equipping people to transform the campuses and the city. We want to try to equip you this coming year so that you could be better and prepared and ready to make a difference. And so I'll share more in the weeks to come. Some of you are ready. <clears throat> you heard in the sermon that we're doing, City on here. I want to talk about just how to be able to reach the city, address the different issues. The sermon afterwards is going to talk about workplace matters, how work matters. I'm going to talk about the theology of work and all these other things. But we want to equip you so that you can grow in learning how to make a difference wherever you go. The fifth is invest in saturating the city with the mission, with mission centers, with mission centers. So we want to talk a little bit about that where we want to see the city of Hong Kong being filled with mission centers. And what that means is that we need to start praying for a facility. We, we might not be able to keep on meeting here like this in the canteen, not only because of the size now, but just for other reasons, we're just thinking, what would it be like if we had our own place? That that can be a missions center. Out of that, we do all the different missional initiatives. We could be kind of a hub in that neighborhood or in that region to be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll love for many of the life groups to come and have their life groups there. We'll love to have different things in that facility. So I want to encourage us. I'm going to talk more about that in the weeks to come, but to actually be praying for God to provide a facility for us so that we can actually have all the things that God is calling us to do. We would love to grow in our children's ministry. But sometimes we just don't have the space. And what would it be like if we had a whole floor for children's ministry in different classrooms so they could come and get ministered unto, experience the love of God? That we could have another floor where we could just meet for just congregational like this. We have just offices there. We can be able to come together and have different meetings. We're praying that we'll saturate the city with mission centers. The last one is invest in training influencers. Let me be clear on this. All of us in this room are called to be influencers. You are going to influence people, whether for good or bad, because that's just how life works. But I'm praying that we will be able to train the influencers, and it's going to be in varying degrees. Some of your influence is not that big right now. Some of you have bigger influences for various reasons, the job that you have, the people that you're connected to, but we're hoping and praying that many of you will be able to make an influence for the kingdom of God. That's why we want to help all of you in your workplace, in your schools, in your neighborhoods, in your family, and also even amongst your friends. We want to try to train you 
to be better influencers. Another thing as I was thinking about this was that we need to raise up new leaders in our church as we're growing. That means we need to raise up elders and deacons in the future. We're not doing that yet, but we're going to look into that, especially for this coming year and the years to come. We need to raise up new executive team members who will be able to lead the church. We need to raise up more life group leaders who are part of a team community that we call TC. We need to raise up, I'm, I'm, I've been praying about this, we need to raise up more pastors. I mean, Pastor Bo is like phenomenal, but I mean like, it's just us two here. And so I realized if we're going to plant more churches and do other things, we need to raise up more pastors. And in our church, the history is, it takes almost 10 years to raise up one that can really lead a church. But we want to try to start that process. And so talk to Pastor Bo. Talk to me if some of you are feeling God placing that in your heart because we want to be able to train people to be influencers in our generation. I want to close with just couple, oh, this one quote, and, and we'll get into prayer. Adoram Judson, a famous missionary to Burma. If you don't know him, you might want to just try to read up on stuff. There's some stuff on YouTube you could read up on him. I was, I've been reading up on him just recently. I've been really blessed just to see his heart and what he had to give up and surrender to serve God. Listen to what he said in his book, or in uh, Edward Judson's book, The Life of Adoram uh, Judson, he says this, A life once spent is irrevocable. It will remain to be contemplated throughout eternity. The same may be said of each day. When it is pa- once passed, it is gone forever. All the marks which we put upon it, it will exhibit forever. Each day will not only be a witness of our conduct, but will affect our everlasting destiny. How shall we then wish to see each day marked with usefulness? It is too late to mend the days that are past. The future is our power. Let us then each morning resolve to send the day into eternity in such a garb as we shall wish it to wear forever. And at night, let us reflect that one more day is irrevocably gone, indelibly marked. What he's saying is that we have a limited amount of time. And with your one life that you have, how will you invest in the things of the kingdom? Because what you do right now here on this earth will make all the difference for eternity. I pray as we share this vision and we want to invest this coming year. I pray that you will make those small investments. Start small first. Maybe go to life group. Be faithful to that. Maybe faithfully giving to the church so we have more resources to do what God has called us to do. Start small. Start praying every single day. Start reading the Bible. Do these simple things and then see what God can do as we sow these seeds. Let it grow because God's going to produce the results. It's going to take time, but let God do his work, and then we're going to show forth his glory and his majesty. Amen? Let's stand together as we close out here. Just go ahead and just take a deep breath. We just just feel the air that goes into your lungs. Exhale that out. See, that breath that you just drew, that's from God. One day that breath is going to be gone. You're not going to live here on this earth. And I don't know, like, I don't know about you, but I'm always thinking about with the end in mind, when I pass away in my funeral, what is it that you want people to say? What kind of impact that you made in another person's life? It's not about doing great things, but it's doing the things that God is calling us to do in a great way, with great love, with great patience, with great compassion, great forgiveness. As we focus on invest, devoting our time, energy, everything that we have to things that are worthwhile, I pray advancing the kingdom of God 
will be one of those things that are worthwhile. Will you invest this year? Invest in your intimacy with God. Invest in the next generation. Invest in the vision of the circle. Invest in getting equipped so that you could make an impact on the campuses or even in the city. And let's invest in saturating the city, saturating these campuses. It's going to take resources. It's going to take people. And let's invest in training influencers in our church. Man, if we could do these six things, I know we'll be one step closer to things that matter to the heart of God. That's more people coming to know Jesus. That's more lives being transformed. More people experiencing the gospel message. I want to invite you to join us. We cannot do this with only a small handful of people. We need as many people as possible. Start small. Just go home tonight and, or this afternoon and just open up the Bible. And just say, God, I want to I wanna be intimate with you. I want to know you. Go to a life group this coming Tuesday and Wednesday and say, I want to give to my life group. I'm not going to be a bystander and just watch, but I want to contribute in the discussion. I want to contribute in my energy. I want to be excited. I want to contribute as I pray for people. And start dreaming big for the kingdom of God. Because He's going to do things beyond our wildest dreams. So Father, I thank You for every single person here. Lord, this is who we are. This is what You've called us to be. Not only children of God, but you've called us to fulfill your mission, the Great Commission here on this earth. You told us to be your witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of this earth. And I just pray that this will be our Jerusalem, right here in Hong Kong. And then we'll begin to ripple out to different cities and different neighborhoods in Hong Kong. And then even in different countries around this area until we reach the circle for your glory and for your namesake. And just like we prayed even last week, we want to keep on praying because we cannot do this on our own strength or power. We need you, Lord. Empower us. Strengthen us. May this year be a year of investments so that even though we might not see the results this year, some of these things, it might take several years, 10 years, but we're in this for the long haul. We're saying, God, here is our life. Do whatever you need to do. We give you our hearts. We give you our lives. I'm going to ask you right now for the next 30 seconds. Can you think about those six things? And just commit right now to say, God, I could at least take one step in this area. Maybe training to be influenced and all this stuff. It's going to take some time. Us saturating the city with mission centers, that's going to take some time. But just think about what you can do right now. And will you commit to that? And just pray a prayer on your own. And just pray just loud enough just to hear yourself. Just say, God, I want to grow intimate with you this coming year as I invest in my walk with you. As I invest through reading the word, through prayer. Something simple. And then we'll close out. Can we just do that right now? Just for 30 seconds, not too long. Thank you for listening to the Harvest Mission Community Church Podcast. For more information, visit our website at hongkong.hmcc.net.